Hello everyone, Ephemeral Equinox here. Today I'm going to be talking about the irregular and magic high school movie, The Girl Who Summoned the Stars. Now let me just preface this by saying that I was really hyped for this movie. Irregular and Magic High School, the series, was outstanding. In fact, it is my favorite anime of all time. Rest assured, I will do an episode on that. But this, this movie is disappointing. What happened? That is my question today. And I think the short answer to that is in the title of this video itself. The precarious nature of scale. This movie lacks focus, which is essential for films. However, for a more in-depth answer, I think we'll have to analyze this movie in detail. Because the point of this video isn't to criticize this movie, but to see what areas could be improved upon, as this series has so much potential. But I think something just went wrong. So without further ado, why is the irregular and magic high school movie so disappointing? Let's start. Well, let's begin from the very basics for those who aren't as familiar with Irregular and Magic High School. So Irregular and Magic High School is an anime set in 2095 AD in an alternate reality where magic exists. The story follows a character named Tatsuya, who is incidentally a magical prodigy and his sister Miyuki. And I believe this premise is where a regular at Magic High School shines, kindling the wisps of intrigue towards the series. The backdrop is as aesthetically pleasing as it is outstanding, fusing two elements which seem so incompatible, the future and fantasy, so well. There is this seamless integration of magic with technology that looks, sounds, and is fantastic, and above all else, makes sense. I mean, if you're wielding magic, the most powerful of all forces, the next logical step would be to optimize it to extreme, to understand it, to research it, to integrate it into our technology and as part of our daily lives. I mean, ask yourself, what would happen if magic were to suddenly appear in society? Well, there would be regulations, governing bodies around magic. Governments would seek to control these powers. Endless hours would be poured into the understanding of this discipline. Magical research startups would rise into multinational corporations, akin to many Silicon Valleys. And all this happens at in a regular at Magic High School. Well, not exactly but it feels like a real world. And you can tell that the creators put a lot of thought into how things would operate and glimpse the painstaking effort they made to build a world which feels so real and organic. And this is what we see in a regular at Magic High School, a take on having a school solely dedicated to magic. But that's enough of me gushing about a regular at Magic High School. I'll save that for another episode. The question is, how does this movie fit into this puzzle? Well, this movie is set at the end of the anime series, after the events of Tatsu and Miyuki's first year at school, which I won't spoil because this isn't the episode. But what we do see is that Tatsu is the equivalent of a super soldier for the Japanese military. Now, if it wasn't implied already, I'm going to spoil the the entire plot of this movie because I just don't think I can discuss it without referencing what happens. So here it goes. I'm not going to go through every event in the movie, but only the events which really stood out to me as examples of design that I want to explore in further detail. Please do watch the movie for the full storyline, but let's begin. Now let's start by discussing the opening shot. The beginning is not too bad at all. We have some really dynamic shots revolving around the characters, and I must applaud the animators for this. This is an absolutely stellar job. And the thing is, the thing about this 
which really brings this out as an outstanding shot, is the fact that it would be almost impossible to replicate with real footage. Even with the use of visual effects, I have trouble imagining how you could emulate such a diverse array of shots. What I would say is that this scene would benefit from more free-flowing camera movement, such as the likes of Kimi no Nawa and Attack on Titan. Why I think that this would be beneficial is that wide arcing movements give into the scale of the world, alluding to so much more of a real world outside what we see and outside the frame. As a side note, I will say that scenes such as this achieved in Kimi no Nawa that use such free-flowing camera movement are wonderful. In this, anime can result in sequences that are so much more fluid, which are difficult to simulate in VFX, if not impossible, such as the case of Ping Pong the Animation. Granted, it is less pronounced in the irregular at Magic High School movie, but the subtle effect influences how the audience sees it. And that word comes again. Uniqueness. The ability to do anything, to be anyone, unrestricted by the limits of reality. Now the next scene is where I think we start to see some of the cracks in this movie. And that is this shot of a soldier cleaving a submarine in half. And I have to ask why the creators of this movie thought that this shot of cutting up the submarine was important because I don't think it adds anything to the plot. And you know what? I didn't even understand what was going on here until I read the synopsis of the light novel it had been adapted from. What is actually happening is that there are three things taking place in this scene. The first is on the ship, where the scientists are harnessing the power of the children to bring down a meteor towards the earth. The second is the submarine, which belongs to the great Asian Union who wants to capture this ship. The third is Benjamin Canopus, who is part of STARS, the USNA military organization who sees the great Asian Union submarine as a threat and destroys it. And as he surf resurfaces, he recognizes the light from the ship and calls it a relic of the Great War. There are two major issues I see from here. Number one, this synopsis from the light novel clearly tells me that this scene wasn't translated well into the movie. For starters, I didn't know that the submarine belonged to the Great Asian Alliance. This is important because they are a key antagonist as a military force trying to take over Japan, the protagonist's homeland having attacked Yokohama earlier in the seri anime series. I didn't know that the flying person was a USNA operative, who by the way has no reason for being in Japan in the first place, because the USNA is based primarily in the US. The fact he is a STARS operative is important as STARS are allies of Japan, as seen by their assistance in the visitor arc of the light novel. Yeah, the one about the vampires, which was also, by the way, really bad. But <laughs> let's not get into that. I didn't even know that the experiment was taking place on the ship. I thought that the ship was completely unrelated to the experiments. I, I didn't even know that they were occurring at the same location. None of that was clear. And when I watched that scene for the first time, all I saw was some random dude cutting up a submarine for no apparent reason. These are all key details which weren't clear at all and meant that this scene amounted to nothing towards my understanding of the plot. And this adaptation from light novel to movie is difficult, I admit. However, there are so many ways to translate this more clearly. For example, a simple monologue from the man in the suit, something like, come on Benjamin, Sirius is relying on you to do this. The Great Asian Alliance cannot be allowed to interfere would help so much. Just a small touch and this could have been all solved. And you know what's even worse? Even after doing so much research just to understand 
what this scene is about. I still think it doesn't add anything to the plot. I mean, what part does the Great Asian Alliance even play in this story? None whatsoever. Outside of this scene, we don't see them in any way, shape, or form. So I asked the creators why they felt the need to include this. It doesn't add anything to my understanding of the novel, except for the fact that the massive CAD ma slash ma magic casting device is valuable, and even that could have been done better. For example, just showing the security around the laboratory via a camera flying through layers of heavily guarded security doors would say that point so much more effectively and without any of the unnecessary plot. And why did I need to know that the CAD was technology before the war? Did knowing that detail contribute towards my understanding of this scene? All these details add up and just make the story feel bloated. You have to understand in a movie or even a regular TV show or a YouTube video, every second is precious. This is especially true in this case where you only have an hour and 30 minutes of your viewer's precious time. So you have to look at each scene individually and ask yourself, how does this scene add to the movie? How does it help my viewers understand the key parts of this movie, book or game better? And if the answer is it doesn't, then you need to remove it. I know it seems heartless, but I have to do the same thing with my videos. Every time I write anything, I have to ask myself, is this what I would love? Is this valuable to someone else? Does this help entertain or inform someone else? And you know what? If it's not, it's in the bin. I understand that this was an adaptation and they didn't have creative freedom. But I'm talking about how they could have changed the movie and the light novel to make the plot better overall. And I know this movie has so much potential. I know it because I've watched the original series. So don't tell me it couldn't have been better. It could have. Okay, now onto my second major issue with this scene. Well, I think it's pretty clear from my previous points but I shouldn't need to read an online synopsis of the story to understand the scene. By making it difficult for your audience to understand what is happening, you are only damaging the original message you try to get across. This is compounded by the fact that this shot of the man cutting up sub this submarine is cross-cut with the other two scenes I mentioned. These multiple events competing for attention just make this scene that much more confusing. Whew. Okay, now that was about the first three minutes and nine seconds. Don't worry, this entire review won't be like this. It's just that in my personal opinion, these first three minutes were pretty important to the story. I also want to say that the mistakes I mentioned beforehand are issues which repeat throughout the movie, so I thought I would get them out of the way now. Unnecessary plot points which drag down the movie and unclear storytelling are prevalent throughout this movie as ev evidenced by the aforementioned examples. Now the next part of this movie moves on to introduce Lena and I'm actually okay with these shots. They're not too bad. They give insight into Lena's personality as still being a child at heart despite her position as commander. However, I think I'll use this opportunity to talk about Lena. Although her introduction wasn't that bad, there's another issue. We haven't seen her before. Okay, that's technically incorrect. She appears in the light novels, but in the anime, she hasn't been introduced yet. In this movie, Lena is already a friend of the main character, expecting us to somehow fill in this gap. Now the problem here originates from the fact that the anime adapts the first seven light novels by Tsutomu Sato, so it was only logical that they would adapt the eighth novel for the movie. But no, you see, this movie adapts the 11.6 light novel, skipping all novels in between. 
Now, I understand that the creators behind this might have had reasons why they couldn't adapt, adapt the other light novels first, but to exclude all the people who only watch the anime is not a great move. And even for those who have read the light novels, which is me, it was still pretty jarring. I mean, in the run-up to this movie, I had heard speculation that they would adapt the 8th light novel about Tatsuya's past and how he gets close to his sister Miyuki, but obviously this was not the case. Introducing a whole new character and expecting them to integrate just doesn't work. But you know what? Apart from that, I'm actually okay with the first half of the story, although I found it a little slow paced. I have to say that the scenes with Miyuki were really cute and it was something novel to see the characters I knew and loved in a new context, simply being themselves. The problem is, despite this being fun, nothing really happens. There's no plot development, nothing. What happens next is that out of the blue we see Katya just shoot a meteor into nothingness and that is a meteor that presented a fairly significant threat to Japan. This is as opposed to the original series, where we see Tatsuya gradually becoming stronger, eventually reaching a climax at the series' end, where he destroys an entire fleet of battleships with the equivalent of a magical nuclear bomb. And yes, I know Tatsuya didn't actually grow because his power level stays relatively the same, but at least there was some perceived obstacle that he overcame through the course of the series that allows him to become that powerful. It feels justified. In the movie, there is no subtlety. It's just, yep, I've destroyed a meteor which could have potentially endangered my entire country in about the first 10 minutes, because I want to. We're also introduced to a new weapon, the seventh plague, which I'm all for, but we're given no insight into how this weapon works and what it does. I mean, it doesn't seem to change how Tatsuya casts spells. I mean, if you're going to add a new weapon, it needs to do something and you need to make it clear. I mean, or well, maybe have Tatsuya fire off a couple of spells and be startled at how fast it reacts. That would add something to the plot. I also want to say, why the hell was Mayumi included into this mess? Why did my waifu have to be collateral damage? But on a more serious note, how come she was related to this in any way? I mean, the entire thing about her mentor being a part of this shady research institute is just too convenient that it seems fake. And the fact that Jumonji knew about this heist on the naval base for some reason just takes away from the legitimacy of the story. The fact that they are so concerned about a single child just astonishes me. And this isn't just restricted to them, because all the characters seem to have an unhealthy obsession with Kokua, the one escapee from the facility. I think they just tried to milk that point that it was child abuse too much. I mean, there is an entire section in this movie reserved just for the characters to be sympathetic to her. For example, I'm a Watatsumi series. I don't have a name. Pity me. Oh, is this bathroom, which is obviously not an aquarium, an aquarium? <sighs> I mean, just please spare me from the let's feel sorry for the kid card. And the fact that they made Kokua a girl as well as being a child just seems like a lazy attempt to garner more sympathy instead of actually coming up with a backstory. The entire shtick where they attempt to paint the organization as evil because they experiment on children just falls flat. I mean, why couldn't they just test on adults? There was no reason given, and all of this could have been solved by a single line such as, children have more magical potential or something. I'm just so confused why there was no explanation for why it had to be a kid. Because when you don't explain something simple like that, you make your audience suspicious. Because just mentioning children doesn't make me agree with your cause. The reactions of the characters to Kokoa mentioning anything tangentially related to her being a kid are exaggerated extremely and they are blatantly trying to draw attention to the fact she is a kid. 
and it's simply way overplayed. And no one's falling for that, especially me, because I'm still technically a kid, as I'm 17 year years old, so don't try that. This is, a this is exceptionally bad, given that this entire sympathy for the kid bit takes about a third of the movie, which makes it feel like filler. Furthermore, there's a huge flaw in all of this, which is the sacrifice for having unlimited power that everyone thinks is such a big deal isn't even that bad. The sacrifice for bringing down a meteor is just emotions. Like, if I could sacrifice all my emotions for the power to bring down a meteor or save someone, I would do so in a heartbeat. But all the characters are like, wow, this is so bad. I mean, what about the sorcery boosters in the first season of the anime? They were so much worse. These required the actual brain of a magician to use, and it is implied that the magicians were being tortured and killed just for their production. Like, why couldn't they have just committed and just said that the sacrifice for using such power just kills the children? That would have made for a more realistic reason to rescue them. The exact same thing applies to all the girls being clones. It's a useless plot point and just leaves all these loose threads hanging. There's also a ba bathing scene in this, so I guess I'll have to address that as well. And yes, this movie does have more fan service. And you could say, wow, they're trying to get garner sexual feelings for people under the age of 18. But dude, look at how old these people look. In one of my previous videos, I've already discussed this, but anime uses high school as a symbol, as a time which people remember with fond memories. It's not because of the age. And do I think that the theme of, of the, sexual, the sexual theme fits in with the overall plot? Well, I mean, I accept edgy content as long as it fits in with the anime and isn't just stuck in there to earn extra money. And yes, I think it fits in with the overall theme of the series. Everything from the feelings Mayumi has for her, I mean, Mayuki has for her brother, to the flirty relationship between Mayumi and Tatsuya fits in with the mature themes and doesn't feel forced. And I don't think they're trying to characterize women as objects. Women are still powerful in this series, and appropriate respect is still given to them. Nonetheless, I do think that Tatsuya should play a lesser role, and Miyuki be allowed to shine more. Now, analyzing once Tatsuya agrees to going to rescue the kids from the lab laboratory, I mean, how come they accept him going to a lab to kill everyone so easily? He's a high school student. I mean, at least they could have called for existence. Mayumi and Mary shouldn't have accepted it so easily. But and like, at least Mayumi should have showed some kind of maternal instinct for her ko kohai, like she showed in the original show. But no, we don't see any of that in this. Another key issue with this movie, which really surfaces towards the ending, is the antagonist and how he's really shallow. The character isn't thought out. I mean, his motive for trying to destroy Japan is to be taken seriously by the government which is a really stupid motive. I mean, I would have preferred it if he had just gone straight insane from the endless hours of working, only wanting to see results and not caring about human life, because what it is now is unrealistic. I think this is embodied most strongly by how quickly Tatsuya deals with him, destroying all his research and his giant CAD in all of, in all of about 10 seconds. Like he doesn't even offer up any kind of fight, just show, illustrating how his motives were never solid in the first place. At least he should have tried to attack Tatsuya, and of course failed, but at least then we would see he was committed to being an antagonist, no matter how fruitless his attempts in the face of Tatsuya's overpowered abilities. And that entire thing about Lina and her crew fighting Tatsuya as an antagonist is wrong. It just feels like an attempt to falsely market the movie to earn more revenue. It's stupid and illogical because they aren't. If you actually read the light novels, you'll see that they're friends. 
They have no reason to fight each other other than an excuse for a fight scene. Like all of the useless battles could have been solved if they just said, hey, I'm from first high school. Or can we not fight because we're allies and we're trying to evacuate people right now. So can we not? I mean, they even say that they recognize each other. Katya recognizing Lena and the stars, yet they still feel like this unjustified need to fight. I mean, surely we'd see them cooperating to, to defeat an evil mastermind, not fighting each other because they don't recognize who is who. And then there's this guy, who is a whole nother problem in himself. I hold a deep appreciation for psychotic characters done well, and that's with emphasis on the done well part. This guy wanted to kill people for no good reason, and I just felt as if his animation didn't fit into the rest of the show. I mean, just look at this. The bottom line is, this movie lacks focus. It tries to talk about too much, and ends up not talking about enough. This is established by all the side characters, who get all of 5 minutes of showtime, because they have too many characters. This is an acute case of too large of a cast, as they tried to cast too wide of a net and ended up with shallow coverage of each. I would have preferred if they had just gone with a few characters and gone more in depth. And I think the movie's title sums it up most aptly. A regular at Magic High School, the girl who summoned the stars. Think about that for a second. A regular at Magic High School. You see the problem? You see, the problem is that in this movie, it stops being about high school. The fascination of relationships in smaller environments and is just lost. And in doing so, it loses the charm of what once made it so great. And I've heard some reviews that say the visuals for this movie were unimpressive, but I don't agree. In my opinion, it was never about or a problem with how the movie looked. The cinematography for this movie is pretty great. We've got some really dynamic shots, different camera angles, really beautifully illustrated characters, and scenic landscapes. They even have depth of field, a feature symbolic of cinematography. And although not particularly difficult, it is a very nice touch which shows the dedication the producers had to this anime. The movie isn't all bad. The soundtrack is delightful and the music accentuates some of the moments in the film and I love that. All the VFX is up to scratch. What I mean by that is that the movie and the series are the only anime I have seen using particle effects to great impact. Okay, maybe with the exception of the Fate series. I mean, if this was purely a technical display, it served its purpose. It was a spectacular one at that. And the key word is spectacle. Because what it feels like is the framework of the movie. The glimmering potential of what it could have been. The painstaking effort. The wishes everyone behind this movie had. I can see that much, but I don't see the substance. And the worst thing is that a simple line of questioning could have saved this movie. For example, this girl can do magic without a CAD? How can she do magic without a CAD? What magic can she do? Let's see an example. How is she cloned? Why do they have to use children? Just simple answers to these questions could have remedied the problems to this movie. To finish, I want to go back to the first time I had heard of this movie. It was 2016 and I was extremely excited for this movie. And in fact, anything related to a regular at Magic High School. I wanted other people to see the wonder that is this series. I kept it in the back of my head, and as time passed, I slowly forgot about it. And you know what? It was two years later that I even knew it came out, because it didn't make a splash when it came out. I didn't even hear about it, and I've subscribed to a lot of anime channels. Hell, I even had a friend who was looking forward to watching it and still didn't know that it had been released until a few days ago when I told him. Look, I appreciate any chance to see the characters I love from Mahoka again, but not in this way. 
I barely finished this movie and I am a diehard fan of this series. And to anyone who wasn't, they would think that this is the best that a regular and magic high school has to offer. And boy, are they wrong. To conclude, this isn't a criticism of the studio or the director or the animator. They probably had deadlines that were too tight and virtually nothing to make this movie. Animating and producing an anime is one of the harshest jobs. People are constantly forced to put out work they aren't proud of and earn nothing for it. And I love this series. I sincerely do. That's the only reason I can be bothered criticizing this series. And the reason why is because I love this series so much. It is so close to my heart because it has impacted me in a way that will stay with me forever. It has made me think deeper, to think more, appreciate animation and the stories behind it so much. I don't want to see the series suffer and drown, so please, I appeal to you, the creators of this movie, to help make this series better, even though I know this will never reach you. And that's pretty much it. This video was pretty hard on me because I don't really like criticizing my favorite series, but I have to face the truth. This is how I think the Irregular at Magic High School movie fails, but also how it could be better. This is Ephemeral Equinox, out.